Kate Forsyth is an award-winning author, poet and storyteller and presenter at the Australian Writers' Centre. Her most recent novel is The Crimson Thread. It's a reimagining of the Minotaur in the Labyrinth myth set in Crete during the Nazi invasion of World War II. Her recent books include The Beast's Garden, which is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast, The Blue Rose, which is named because of a rose in a Chinese fable, Beauty in Thorns, which is a retelling of Sleeping Beauty, and Bitter Greens, just to name a few, which is a retelling of Rapunzel. She's written so many books, I think close to 50 books, which is huge. Let's have a chat with Kate Forsyth. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kate. Oh, thank you for having me, Valerie. It's always a pleasure to see you. Oh, so excited about your latest book, The Crimson Thread. Now, I have so many questions for you. Uh, But first, can you tell us what it's about for our audience who haven't yet got their hands on uh, on on their own copy? I would love to. Thank you, Valerie. So The Crimson Thread is a historical novel for adults which reimagines the Minotaur in the Labyrinth myth set in Crete during World War II and it tells the story of a young Greek woman who finds herself torn between her family and her country and between her need to uh, try and save her country and the man that she loves. Now the book has already made such a splash not only in Australia but everywhere. The Washington Post, the San Francisco Review, so many other places have had just glowing reviews. Can you tell us what was the seed of this idea? What made you start thinking, I'm going to retell this story and and set it in this era? Um, it actually began a long time ago when I was a little girl and I spent a summer with my grandparents um, on my own for the very first time. And um, I kind of ran out of books to read, so I, I was given a box of old children's books to read. And I and um, I read two books back to back. One was this account of some English schoolgirls who had to flee over the Swiss Alps to escape the Nazis and the Gestapo. And um, I got I, I just love this story. And that night I was telling my grandparents all about it. Um, and I, I guess I was really animated for the first time since I'd been there because it, it you know um, you know they got really animated too and started telling me stories about you know, their role during World War II and also, you know, their brothers and brothers-in-law. And um, I heard this story about my great-uncle Jerry who fought on Crete and then had this incredible escape over the towering White Mountains chased by Nazis and being bombed by the air and spitfires and machine guns and they had to hide in caves and they they barely managed to escape. You know, it, it was like, you know, by the skin of their teeth. And um, this story just really um, interested me, excited my imagination. Um, And then the very next day, I read the book about the Minotaur in the Labyrinth myth um, in Tales of the Greek Heroes. And that, that ancient myth is set in Crete as well. And so I'd never heard of this island. And then suddenly I had these two fantastic stories set there um, it really fixed Crete in my imagination as a place of danger and magic and, and mystery. Now, let's fast forward about 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I I stumbled across an old, I collect old books of fairy tales and myths. And I found this absolutely magnificent first edition copy of um, Tanglewood Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And um, it was such a treasure. And as I'm reading through it, this is his retelling of the Greek myths for children. And I reread the Minotaur and the Labyrinth myth for the first time since I'd been a kid. And it just reminded me of this story about my great uncle. And it just reminded me about how much I loved Greek myths. Mm. And I just began to think, oh, I could do something with this and my imagination kind of seized on hold of it and began to work with it. So I began to Google as one does and I was Googling World War II in Crete and I stumbled across this article about the forgotten women of the underground resistance and their incredible acts of bravery and as soon as I read this article I knew I had my story. 
They were the wow. three elements that I needed. I think you always need three ideas for a really good novel. And so I had World War II soldiers in Crete, Australian soldiers in Crete. I had the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, and then I had the women of the underground resistance. And I knew I was onto a winner straight away. Brilliant. Now, you say that you collect old books of fairy tales. You're obviously really interested in fairy tales and legends and fables. Um, this is a retelling of the, the 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 myth of the Minotaur. And your previous books are also reimaginings or retellings of everything from Rapunzel to Beauty and the Beast and so on. Where did this fascination with fairy tales come from? Yeah, I think it all all began when I was seven years old and I was um I was being rushed to hospital and my mother deceased and my mother kept a box of books hidden so that whenever I had to go to hospital unexpectedly she could just grab a book because she knew that I I would be well not happy but I'd be calm and and comforted by having something to read. And so she kept an emergency bag. So she just grabbed this copy of the Grimm's Fairy Tales. Um, it's a beautiful red leather bound edition, which was um, retold by Lucy Crane and illustrated by Walter Crane. And, um, you know, it's awful being a child sick in hospital. I was frightened, I was in pain, I was feverish. I had to be left there. Um, it was in the days when parents didn't stay with their sick child in hospital. And um, I was very, um, well, I was trapped. I, I was imprisoned, you know, in those white hospital beds with the prison bars up. I was tied down with uh, tubes and, um, and, and drips. But as long as I was reading this book of fairy tales, my imagination could leap free. And I could be anyone and be anywhere. And fairy tales, I think, are stories of hope and consolation. And so for a sick little girl, they gave me hope that one day I would be healed and I, I would be free. Mm. And so I've always had this deep fascination with fairy tales ever since that time. And I guess it, it just works its way through my imagination and, and into my writing. So Bitter Greens, your novel Bitter Greens, was a reimagining of Rapunzel. Was that the first reimagining you did? So it was the first um, direct retelling that I did. Um, all of my books have got fairy tale themes in them, themes of imprisonment and escape, roses and thorns, mm. um, wounding and healing, those types of themes have always been prevalent in my work. But Bitter Greens was the first time that I actually set out to do a literal retelling of a tale. Um, and I, it had actually, I I tried before. I had tried, I you know, I first wrote it as a story when I was about 12. Oh. And then, you know, so it, it had kind of been infesting my imagination for a long time, but it just felt like the right time to do it. Um, it was the first year that I could write full time with all three of my children at school. Right. Okay. So with with that then, when you decided, okay, I'm going to write Bitter Greens, which is almost 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years 10 ago. Years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, at that point, did you think, is that as far as you went in terms of planning your author career? Because since then, you've done many reimaginings. Did you know at that point you were going to actually then write further novels of reimaginings? Um, I didn't know, but I wondered. I thought it might be possible. Um, I wrote Bitter Greens as part of a doctorate of creative arts in which um, I used the fairy tale of Rapunzel as a lens to look at the history of human storytelling and the, and the purpose and meaning of fairy tales and myth and the way that they can still be used for spiritual healing today. So my doctorate was really concerned with all types of, of human storytelling, but I just focused on one particular fairy tale as a way of kind of illuminating why we tell stories and why they're still important. Um, and I loved that so much. I loved the research that I was doing. I loved writing Bitter Greens. It was a terribly 
difficult and challenging book to write because it was so complex, three different historical periods, three different voices. But you know what? The more difficult the job, the more I love it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at writing me. simple stories. It, it just isn't the way my imagination works. So I loved it so much. And then Bitter Greens was like my breakout novel. Um, it sold, it, it has sold almost half a million copies alone, I think. Um, Incredible. So it just seemed, it just seemed the right road for me to travel just then. And then, of course, um, the more I do it, the more people want me to do it. Mm-hmm. And the more, um, you know, I've carved out a niche for myself that no one else is really doing. Mm. And by that I mean that um, there are many people who are doing literal retellings of fairy tales where they take a well-known tale, let's say Cinderella, and then they have a girl called Cinderella in a fairy tale land and they're just expanding the what we call the crystallised tale, you know, the best-known tale, and adding action, dialogue and description to it. I love literal retellings of fairy tales and I read a lot of them, but it's not what I want to do. Um, Mine are much more symbolic or Mm. metaphorical retellings. I take the, the, you know, the symbols and the structures, um, the, the hidden architecture of the story, and then I retell it in a very unexpected and surprising way. Mm. And not many people are doing that. No, there are so many layers to your stories. So with Crimson Thread, let's talk about, can you just walk us through almost like a, a, if you can um, pinpoint, a bit of a timeline. When did you start writing it? How long did your first draft or, you know, some, whether it was your first, second or third, a draft you're happy with, um, take? And then how long was the editing process? Um, so the Crimson Thread took roughly three years, um, which is, is quite a long time for me. Um, it was partly because the research was so intensive mm-hmm. and partly because I had a lot going on in my personal life at that time. Both my mother and my father um, were getting old and frail and unwell and needed a lot of help. Um, I needed to help them pack up their house and move them and look after them. And then my daughter needed a lot of loving while she was going through her final years of school. So I was do- I, I was doing a lot with my family. Mm-hmm. Um, so the research, you know what I, I like to call the daydreaming stage, which is reading, planning, daydreaming, you know, thinking about my characters, developing their voice. That usually takes me about a year and then the writing and rewriting normally takes me a year. Um, So this book was just amplified beyond Mm. that. So it is set in Crete during the war. Um, You were not around during the war and you don't live in Crete. (laughs) So um, have you spent time in Crete? Yeah, so um, my family and I spent a month in Greece um, while I was doing the early, um, early research for the book, I had planned to go back, but, you know, plagues and pandemics prevented <laughs> that for me, which which was actually quite difficult for me, but did give me an insight into how one can research a book without actually going somewhere. Um, I'm, I always do what I like to call a very deep, immersive research, and so I like to cook that my character would be eating. I like to listen to the music that they like to listen to. I like to read only what they would have read. Um, I, you know, I've even been known to start dressing like my characters would dress um, because the character, the you know, my my protagonist kind of comes to possess me in a way. So that's what I was doing with the with the Crimson Thread. Um, I can make a pretty fabulous lemon and rosemary slow roasted lamb dish now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <Yeah. laughs> and because the thing is that when you, you're there uh, as a reader, you're there um, and you're in, you know, Crete is foreign to me, um, but but I'm absolutely there. However, what I think is absolutely fantastic about the way you take the reader there is that you're not kind of 
banging people over the head with the whole history of Crete and, you know, its geography and population stuff. Because, you know, I, I read a book the other day where it was set somewhere else and it was I practically had a PhD by the end in this mm. in this country. But you do it through things like the food, the wine, the frescoes, the stones, the description of steps. Um, it's the little things. Mm. And what do you do in order to get to know the little things, to see the little things? I mean, you just explained about the food, but but other things that, that the character is, is seeing in the street, what do you do with that? So um, I call it the telling detail. Like I always think that, that one small telling detail is far more vivid and, um, it, you know, evocative than um, pages of description. And so I, I, and I try and make sure that every single page, you know, sometimes I think that um, you can read a book and it, it feels like they've just copied and pasted out of Wikipedia or yes. some other research book and they've just dropped in this kind of cold, inert, dead, you know, detailed historical research or, or and it, and, and for a moment you slip out of the book and it feels like you're reading, you know, a lecturer's notes. And to me that's dead and cold and inert. So I'm constantly working to see, to, to think what would, you know, what would Alenka be seeing now? What would she be smelling? What would this taste like? How is she feeling? I'm interested in the emotional resonance of a scene, not the physical representation of a scene. And so when I'm um, trying to describe this to students or in a lecture, I say, well, if I ask you all to describe this room, you would probably go, well, it has, it has white walls and a brown floor and it has a, you know, a, you know, this and that. I'm going, that's not what I want at all. How does this room make you feel? And then, well, it makes me feel fearful and anxious because it's so dark and echoing and shadowy. That's what I'm interested in, the emotional resonance of the scene. And so that's what I'm searching for. And all I want is one telling detail that somehow brings it to life. How do I find it? Mm. I have to search for it and I have to think about it. I love um, watching any um, videos of the time and place and, of course, 1941 to 1945, which is the period that the Crimson Thread is set in, is close enough to our times that there are plenty of videos. And so I was able to watch videos of the German you know, Stukas and their dive bombing and that they had this machine attached to them that screamed like a banshee because it was psychological warfare as well as physical warfare. And so listening to that, I mean, I'm just getting chills mm. now remembering it. It was terrifying. So, I, you know, to me, what would it be like to be on the ground with a German Stuka coming at you, at, you know, from the sky like an eagle swooping down with this banshee scream? Mm. Mm. That's what I'm interested in. Wow. Now your um, notebooks the, you, you, are, the, are a bit legendary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For people who aren't familiar with them, Kate has a, a notebook or maybe sometimes several notebooks dedicated to each story. So when and when did this notebook start? So and and what kind of stuff did you put in it? Yeah, so um, I I keep a daily journal which I keep near the hand at all times, um, and I tend to scribble any ideas that come to me into that daily journal. Um, when I can feel that surge of excitement and electricity all through my body that tells me that I've got a living story to tell, then I go in search of the perfect notebook. Um, for me, it has to be beautiful. It has to be durable. Mm. And um, it has to speak s s somehow to my project. So for the Crimson Thread, I have um, a beautiful paper blanks I've got four of them. It was a four notebook project. <laughs> um, it's crimson and it's got, um, you know, like, you know, um, you know, like a golden labyrinth, you know, 
mapped upon it. So it's absolutely beautiful. What goes into it? Um, all my thoughts, questions, um, lists of things to do, maps, diagrams, um, lists of reading books, um, you know, research books that, that I think I need to buy, um, uh, photographs of places. I also use a lot of Pinterest. So I go through and I pin photographs of the places I'm writing about and then I stare at them and imagine myself into them. Um, I, you know, recipes, um, music. I, I also make a playlist. So on, on Spotify, I have a playlist called The Crimson Thread and I listen to this playlist list obsessively. So I listen to it before I go to sleep at night. I listen to it when I'm walking in the morning. Um, as the story grows and changes, I might drop some music out of it because that music is not sparking ideas for me. But in general, each piece of music begins to have a scene or a character attached to it. And so when I need to write a scene, that particular scene, I might play that piece of music over and over and over again, 13 or 14 times in the hour that I'm writing that scene. Um, anything that transports me out of my body and into the skin of my protagonist. Um, I, I use um, scent a lot as well. So I burn scented oils, which help me transport me as well. So what, what yeah. scent did you have for the Crimson Thread? I always have the same scent. It's called Joy. Okay. And it is oh. um, in in essence joy. And so every morning when I come into my space, I light a candle and burn some oil. Um, and then I often have to replenish it over the course of the day. Um, I do have a friend though, Kate Quinn, has a, mm. a different scent for every single one of her books, which I think is <laughs> extraordinary. Yes, I love that. Okay, you mentioned um, your students and, of course, you're one of our fabulous presenters at the Australian Writers' Centre and you teach a number of courses. One of the courses that you teach is called Dare to Dream, which in itself is so evocative. Um, what is what is your aim in that course? Um, so Dare to Dream is a course that, that you know, we kind of came up with because um, whenever I am teaching or talking, I often get um, writers in my audience who have either been so um, hurt or, or or damaged by unkind and injudicious criticism earlier in their in their careers, or have tried and struggled and tried and struggled and tried and struggled and have been unable to find the way to write or have been writing, have been published, but are so exhausted and so burnt out that they feel that their well of inspiration is completely drained. And I find that these writers instinctively come to me for help. People often email me. People who don't even know me will hear me speak on the radio and then they'll send me like pages and pages and pages of heartbreak and hurt. And I just came to realise that... Um, that because creative artists are often sensitive souls who have often struggled all of their life to find a way to, to you know, give that expression and have been so hurt, mm -hmm. there was no one doing anything doing, there was no one doing anything for them. And so I thought, well, what, what would be my job? My job would be to give them the, a little bit of love and reassurance and and hope that they can overcome these blockages. It would be to inspire them, to have them going away from any course with me, re-energized and full of new ideas and fresh energy, revitalized. And it would be my job to give them some tools so that they could never, ever, ever be in such a wasteland of um, exhaustion and despair ever again. And so that's what Dare to Dream is all about. It's all about the feeling that they should have when they're writing, which is a feeling of um, focus, purpose, um, rightfulness and joyousness. Mm. I think that it's so, that's such an incredible thing because it's such an intangible, creativity is so intangible and it can be easy to get beaten down 
sometimes illogically, sometimes logically, <laughs> it's easy to get um, uh, completely despondent about whether you're going in the right direction or if you are even should be on this path or not. Um, that something like that is so useful. And what I think is great about the way you do these sorts of things, it's not, you know, just rah-rah, it's practical. You mm. actually do give people um tools that they can use that then make a difference which is which is brilliant well um you know I'm so glad that you say that because that's actually what I really wanted to do there's often a lot of talk about what about creativity but there's no practical tools and particularly not for the day-to-day struggle of writing you know writing um can be um unbelievably uh, you know, joyous and easy and fluid and liberating, or it can be um, like struggling through quicksand, you know. And the more it's like quicksand, you know, the less pleasure that there is in the writing, the less likely you are to want to do it. And, of course, writing is like any other art. The more you do, the better you get at it. So, you know, people often ask me questions like, how do I know if it's going to be any good? Mm-hmm. or um, how do I know if, if it, it's a good idea, I, you know, and then how can I actually find the time? You know, we're all time poor, and so I'm, I give them very, very practical solutions to these problems. Mm, wonderful. Now, um, now that the Crimson Thread is out there and, you know, taking on the world, mm-hmm. are you already writing your next book? I am, indeed. So I'm... I'm still in the early stages of it. Um, so the, the the book is fully planned. Um, I do love to plan because I find it, it really empowers me and gives me a strong sense of what it is that I need to do. I'm doing research now for um, I'm not quite in the world yet. The world is not living in my imagination and that can sometimes take quite a long time. So I'm in that process of reading as much as I can. Now, because this book is set so, so, so long ago, it's set in the early kingdom of Rome. Um, It's it's a retelling of an ancient, you know, Greco-Roman myth. And so I can't go to YouTube and watch videos about what life was like back then. And there was, you know, there are no real books. It's it's all lost in the myths, myths of myth, which is kind of fabulous, but also makes it much harder for me. So I'm listening to a lot of audio books at the moment about the Etruscans and about the ancient Romans, and I'm just um, exploring as many books as I can to try and bring it to life in my imagination. Oh my god, I'm so excited by that. I I love Rome. I love ancient Rome. I when I went to Rome for the first time and I finally got to the forum and I was just wandering around by myself and I just started to cry <laughs> because I just love it so much. I cannot wait to read it. How exciting. Uh, it, I was the same when mm. I went to Rome and I'm I'm hoping to go back next year. Um I've been there several times now, but th- this idea that um you know this you know, people were living there and dying there like 5,000 years ago. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, you've written so many books that, to be honest, I've lost count. So can you tell me how many you're up to now? (laughs) Um, By the end of this year, I would have had 48 books published. I have three books being published this year. So my three books this year are obviously The Crimson Thread, which um, has been out for a month. Then earlier this year I had um, this beautiful book, The Gardener's Son and the Golden Bird and Other Tales of Gentle Young Men, which is part of a series of long-lost fairy tales that I do every year. And then in a couple of months I have this beauty coming out, which is a collection of my writings and poems um, but I've worked in conjunction with the artist Wendy Sharp. Wendy Sharp, yes, I recognise that. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah so oh, I, wonderful. Yeah, so every page, it's completely different. Every page is like a delicious surprise. And the book charts a, um, a woman's life journey from from youth and innocence through 
you know, love, passion, despair to the, you know, the wisdom of being a crone. Yeah, right. Wow, it looks sumptuous. Oh, I can't wait for that as well. Um, okay, 48 books, which is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you know that's written 48 books? So obviously you have a lot of, um, well, experience in wisdom under your belt. So finally then, what are your, t- for the newbies out there who are nowhere near 48 books, um, what are your top three tips for them to, not so much writing tips, but it's it's what you were talking about in in dare to dream. It's it's your 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 tips for them to stay on the path and know it's worthwhile. Yes. Um. Look, my three top tips would be first of all try and build writing into your daily life, and by this I don't just mean working on your novel or or your memoir or you know whatever your project might be. I mean writing for pleasure every single day, keeping a journal writing a poem whenever it takes you, um, you know, playing and experimenting and just loving the craft of writing. Not everything that we write has to be for a purpose. Sometimes we discover by doing and the more you write, the, the, the better a writer you will be and the more easily the writing will come. So if you can build it into your daily practice, just like a ballerina must do her stretches or uh, a musician must play their scales, a writer must write all the time. So that's, that, that's my first and most important tip. My second tip is about learning to maintain faith in, in yourself and in your story. I find that um, a lot of aspiring authors um, their ego is so tangled up in the task. They have a great hunger for outside validation. They want people to tell them that they're brilliant, that the work is fantastic, that that it's it's never that you know they're one of the greatest writers that has ever lived. And then if they don't get that constant validation, then their self doubt tears into pieces. Um, there's no room for ego in art. You, you must come to the practice of your art as you would to to uh, a religious practice, you know, something that you do that sublimates your ego. You need to think of your story as being a living thing that has chosen you. And if you allow your insecurities and your anxieties and your desire for outside validation to um, ruin your ability to to actually create art, then your story will die. And so think of it as a a living creature that has come to you and it's your job to give it life. And it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you don't give up, as long as you allow that story to live. So that's my second piece of advice. And my third piece of advice is practice self-care. Writing is very hard on the body and very hard on the brain. We spend long hours hunched over a steaming hot keyboard. <laughs> we spend long hours perusing, you know, difficult books of research. And, you know, our, our brains sometimes feel like they're boiling in our skull. We need to make sure that we walk every day in, in fresh air and sunshine, that we don't overeat or overdrink or overpartake of anything, any mind altering substances. Our body is a temple. So hot baths with scented oil, walks in the fresh air, swim in the ocean, yoga, meditation, listen to music, empty yourself of words at least once every single day. Because when we empty ourselves of words, then we create space for more words to come in. Brilliant. And on that note, Thank you so much for your time today, Kate. That is my pleasure, Valerie.